you need to own it up and just stop blaming everyone. You know what I mean? Fix the problem. We're a technician. Sort it out. If it's not running, why is it not running? And figure it out. That's our job. Don't complain for four hours. You know what I mean? So what's up, HVAC crew? I guess I need to start saying trades crew. That's what Ryan's been using. Getting the trade hounds going. We got a uh, we got a good episode tonight. I'm pretty pumped about this one. Riding probably not so much. We got a we got a technical guy on the show tonight, so we'll hear Ryden. He'll chime in here and there. <laughs> I'm always excited to learn uh, this. <laughs> so uh, yeah, let's. Uh, we got some technical knowledge coming. Um, another good guest. So let's get it going. Yeah, come on. So welcome back again, HVAC crew. It's great to be here. Uh, Dennis and I have had a fun week. We're getting getting to do some extra recording, which is even funner because sometimes we miss a week. Now we get to double up. So there's nothing better than having multiple conversations in a week and just expanding our knowledge and finding some more stuff to teach you guys about too. So uh, it's just like Dennis sleep. said, all, yeah, just yeah. less sleep. Who needs sleep? We'll sleep when we're dead. It's overrated. Welcome to the trades. That's right. So, uh, as usual, got to do the uh, shameless self-promotion to get the show started off. Uh, so, uh, once again, guys, I will pull up the uh, 2022 Pink Warrior hat. We still got a few left. Make sure to get in the swag shop and grab you one of those. All proceeds are going to fight breast cancer and promote breast cancer awareness. Also, please make sure to follow us on Instagram at HVACRD, as well as on TikTok and Facebook and LinkedIn. And also, our one of our really favorite places, the Trade Hounds app, which is an app designed specifically for tradespeople like ourselves and you guys. Great community, great camaraderie, fostering a big trade family. Um, like I said, we put uh, some exclusive content on there that we don't put anywhere else. Also, if you didn't catch it, uh, we dropped our new stickers on November 4th over there on Trade Hounds, so make sure to go back and check that out if you hadn't seen it. You can find a link to our Trade Hounds account and become our friends and join the app if you check the link tree in our bio on any of our social media. Also, if you hadn't got your uh, registration done, your room booked, and your bags packed, and your tickets purchased if you need them to get to AHR 2023 in Atlanta, uh, we will be live on the podcast pavilion floor on Monday and Tuesday. We've got meet and greets Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Um, also, our guest this evening will be a fellow member of the podcast pavilion. So make sure that uh, you check all of us out when we're there together. And speaking of guests, I really want to say a, a big thank you to uh, our guest tonight. He is very busy. He is in the midst of a 30-day video challenge on YouTube, so we are taking away precious time from him right now, <laughs> and we are, we are very grateful for that. So uh, you all know him as the Refrigeration Mentor or at Refrigeration Mentor on social media, but please welcome our new friend, Mr. Trevor Matthew, to the show. I came to get down, so get down to see and jump around, jump around. Your moms, I came to drop bombs. I got more rhymes than the bottles got songs. 
how you guys doing? How you hey. doing? What's up, man? Good, man. Oh, man, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for the invite. This is an honor. So where are you uh, Where are you at? I don't even know. I'm just outside of Toronto, probably about an hour, hour and a half outside Toronto. Okay. In Ontario, Canada. And we are in the usual, Canadian loop, man. We, we love our Canadian friends. That's right. <laughs> oh, we're awesome. That's right. You yeah. are. You guys are. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, we're going to get it. We'll get into all the stuff you got going on. I can't even keep up here on social media what you got going on, man. You're killing it. Thank um, you. Now, I don't know if you've listened to the show, but before we get started, we got to talk about what we're drinking. It doesn't have to be alcohol. We usually cover that for everybody if they don't have it. Um. So yeah, you get to go first. What do you got? What are you drinking on? Uh, Palo Grino. That's what I'm drinking. Good old sparkling water. Oh, nice. I can't Very believe nice. you brought that. Because <laughs> that's what I got. No beer for me tonight. I have got a Aha. These are my favorite. Blueberry pomegranate. Sparkling water. I haven't even opened this yet. Wow, these things are. That's money on the old. Yeah, these things are pop. They're sparkly, man. You could have said sure. whatever, uh, anything, and you know, it would have been like, wow. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will throw some reverb on that. It'll be amazing. <laughs> um, Ryden's probably not drinking water. I'm just throwing that out there. Oh, I do. I do have some water. Um, but, be. but, but, but uh, next to it, uh, I guess, uh, I drink alone <laughs> with nobody else. <laughs> oh, uh, boy. It's a classic. It's my favorite classic of the, the show. It's a hitchhiker. It's, it's a hitchhiker. God, you, it's like an endless supply of those over there at your house. Uh, if one day those guys would just send it to me for free, it would be amazing. Oh, uh, boy. So, so that's a, uh, yeah, yeah, I was going to say, that's a Modelo for him. It, we, it, it's picked up the hitchhiker name over the past year or so. Oh, yep. yeah? Long story. You yeah. know, it's a... I think he... Yeah, you talked about... I don't know what episode that was, but... It was a while ago. Um, but yeah, just gosh, a Modelo. I'm, I'm, yeah, no, I'm Good trying beer. to even think of which one it was. Yeah, I'm definitely into my craft beer. I, uh, I brewed for many years. I have a whole brewing uh, oh, system. Oh, wow. Yeah, I can do a barrel or fifty gallons at a time. I got a partner. We got a whole like whole shed full of brewing, like <laughs> massive fermenters, nice uh, coolers. Uh, yeah, we brew a lot. Oh, I did brew a lot. I think I, I took off the last couple of years. I've been slowing down, and he's still brewing. He's a brew master. He actually took his. Uh, he went to school, and he's a scientist now. We were just home brewers, and we were just pumping out kegs each week. Like right. we couldn't we couldn't keep them full. And uh, so he went to school for it, and like we, he talks about stuff that just, just he can tell you any beer you he drinks now. He can tell you exactly what's in it. I'm like, what? <laughs> so, so, it's like so, a sommelier yeah. of beer. Oh man, yeah. And he t- the water he can tell anything. It's it's crazy in two or three years, like because we brewed for years together, made a lot of beer, drank a lot of beer, <laughs> uh, but now he he it's a science, it's an art. <clears throat> So do you think he would come on the show? No, oh, yeah. he, he lo- loves his beer. Oh, he loves man. talking about beer. I'm gonna, we got to get him on the show, man. I know. That's, yeah, for sure. I mean, we're, we've had some, uh, we've, you know, Matt, Matt's a pretty, uh, he can talk some beer. Oh, yeah. Um, we've had quite a few guests that will uh, start rambling on that. But I can't believe you, you're drinking water tonight. You, you're a brew, you know, half a brewmaster, and I'm drinking water tonight. We finally get a guy <laughs> on the show that's a huge beer guy, and there's two of us drinking water, but that's all right. I got to take a break. I got you back. We're, I got we're, you we're, back, D. We're, we're this second <laughs> podcast in a row. I know you got me. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, let's just catch up. So give us a little bit of, um, a little bit of background of how you got into – HVAC or HVACR and what you, you know. And that's for, for people that, yeah. Yeah. And like for people that, that, that haven't even gotten to follow you or anything. Cause, 
I feel like we, we constantly are trying to just introduce as many people as we can to as many people as we can. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. Yeah, it started back. I'm a first gen refrigeration mechanic. Uh, started back in 2004, 2003, 2004, 2005, I guess. I went to university, you know, college, did all that stuff that people told me that I needed to do and mm -hmm. I finished all that stuff. <laughs> and then I was looking for work. <laughs> you know how it is. Uh, working for 14 bucks, going to employment agencies. And then uh, I was actually going back to school for a different uh, industry. I was going to go do bartending uh, because I wanted to travel and uh, stumbled along refrigeration somehow. And I actually met a guy and he told me about uh, told me about it. I'm like, what? He's like, you know, uh, when you go into a grocery store and you get food. I'm like, yeah, I bought groceries before. Yeah, people need to fix that shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> they need to fix that and service that. I'm like, okay, can you travel with that? Well, do you think they have fridges on the other side of the world? I'm like, a oh, good point. Right. <laughs> and then uh, then I was like, how much did they make? It was like, my dad does it, and he's like, 50 bucks an hour. I'm like, signed up that day. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> never looked back. <laughs> nice. And so that, that was the beginning of it. So I did like a HVAC program. Uh, I got some gas fitter tickets and oil burner license, and then I uh, – then I start to travel. I needed to, I travel for work. So I'll tell anyone out there, um, if you're not working or slow in an area, and it's always busy everywhere, I travel to get experience. Like I moved across countries, different provinces, different countries uh, to learn. And, uh, you know, when you have a, a, a family, it's a little bit more difficult. But when I started out mid-20s, um, right. I could do that. And even now, I, I travel for my work, right? I just bring my family with me now. Uh, but it's uh, over the years, I started to develop. I really liked a refrigeration. So I uh, found a company in the opposite side of the country where I was from. And um, they were just, it was wide open there. So I actually traveled uh, to a different province and started in uh, construction, supermarket construction work. Oh, nights, months, out of town, all that stuff. 80, 100 right. hour weeks, just learning and uh, smashing it, to be honest with you. I've seen, you know, younger guys come and go, but I knew I was motivated, right? I was, I got, I think uh, the four years of university and college, I got a lot of it out of me. <laughs> I, right. Actually, I didn't, but I thought I did. And, uh, and I was, I was motivated. I was focused. So I, I bust my ass for three, four years, real hardcore working anywhere they needed me, I'd go and, you know. Over the years, I complained a little bit more. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. But when I was seeing those paychecks, it, it made it uh, worth it because I had goals. Like I set goal. My goal was to become a refrigeration journeyman, a, a mechanic. So I took three or four years to do that. So that was one goal that I had. But my main goal even before that was because like I told you guys, I wanted to travel. So I, I knew if I got this, this ticket and this trade that I could travel with it, plus make some okay money. So... Back in 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, I was just working wide open, partying real hard too, but I was working. Uh, work came first and uh, always showed up to work. Make sure you guys show up to work. If you say you're going to be somewhere, be there. You know what I mean? Don't flake out. Right. You know, this is what's happening out there now. Like I'm talking yep. to so many companies like, and they're like, they just don't show up. They don't call. They don't let us know. Like, uh, you know, this is a this is a huge career that you can be so successful. I know so many millionaires that they started out as a technician. So many, right? So Me many. too. Yeah, business owners. Yep. Residential, commercial. I mean, it, it, you got to be driven, though. You got to. <laughs> nobody's gonna hand it to you. Hundred percent that I know of, but. Yeah, so, so I did that. So I worked real hard, made a bunch of money, and then I'm like, okay, I want to travel now. I figured out how to move to Australia. So I, I figured out all the different um, paperwork I needed to do, all the different licenses I needed to do, and uh, flew across the ocean and went and worked for a year in uh, another country with my wife. It was awesome. I learned so country, much there. I was say, what country? Oh, it was Australia. Okay. I don't know yeah, if I did so say that. No, you did. Yeah, right. You did, but I didn't know if you were going to another one because you were saying you were continuing to travel to different ones. Oh, yeah. so I was making sure I didn't like miss a whole step in the journey here. I did travel to a bunch of countries, but I didn't work in all of them. I uh, just worked in uh, 
Australia. So you see a big difference there on as far as the trade goes, or or is it pretty? Is it pretty much the same? I mean, I know no, the you make great money. Circuit's the same, but lots. yeah, no, you make good money. It's same type of work, you know. Guys work real hard out there, and girls, and it's uh, you know, I, I did really well while I was there. Now, did you uh, work in a major city, or were you more rural, or both? Okay. I worked in a, a city called Perth. That was where I did most of my work. So I was doing more of AC. That's when I first seen like inverters and VRVs and stuff like that, VRFs, whatever you want to call them, and didn't have a clue what they were, uh, to be honest with you. And um, so I did like a lot of air conditioning, commercial air conditioning. And then I actually moved into the to the boonies pretty much in the middle of nowhere, it's a town called Broome. Uh, most people even in Australia may not even know where, where this is. <laughs> um but I learned so much in this little town. Uh, it was the dry season and uh, ran out of gas. Me and my wife were driving around. We had no money left. <laughs> and we hit this little town called Broom. I think we had $500 left. I think that's it. And we're sleeping in a tent. And I'm like, okay, I need to make some money. So I just went around the, the, this little town of 6,000 people and started knocking on doors. First, started looking for um, companies in a phone book and calling them up. And, uh, you know, oh, some people were like, no, we don't need anybody. We don't need them. Then I went and walked and knocked at the doors and went to see them face to face. And people were like, no, we don't get any work. We're, we're all busy. So I went to this one company called Kiss Refrigeration. I knocked on the door and I'm like, listen, I'm a refrigeration technician. I'm looking for work. I'm willing to do whatever I need to to start here. And they were like, can you start tomorrow? I'm like, what? Yeah, I can yes, start please. tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no problem. It was actually my birthday the next day, and I was kind of inside like, ugh. <laughs> you know, I just get to a new new city. There's lots of cool things on the go. A little, well, I guess a, a little town. But um, he said, do you want to work tomorrow? And it was my birthday. And I went. I did it. I crushed it. I worked 16 hours, I think, the first day. You know, and they would just show me. And I worked on so many cool things. Coffee makers, pop machines, water coolers. Australian naval ships, you name it. I worked nice. on it. diesel transport trucks, vehicles, uh, ammonia uh, fridges, like in RVs. Like, yeah, I, I only worked there six weeks, and I mean, I learned a lot of stuff from this guy. That's awesome. Wow. Now um, that because, is man. That's a that's say, a that's a little bit of a crazy story. I mean, that's <laughs> that's, that's one sweet. of many. <laughs> you can't. Uh, yeah, I can only imagine. Uh, yeah, you can't not learn going that route. Um, I, I look at so I look back at when I was when I was like you said that age at my twenties. I, I I knew I didn't want to go to college, right? So I a lot of my buddies were doing that and wasn't getting nothing out of it. So um, I went ahead and went went hands on. And uh, in the carpentry and, you know, woodworking. And so, just like you said, I worked around the clock and then got married. And then she was just had to be drug on the journey just the same. Right. She's uh, my wife. I drug her around. So I look at these kids now, man. I mean, they, they get like mid 20s and they're they're wanting to like. What's my vacation time? And like you said, they don't show up. And it's like, look, this is the time when you need to do this. Yeah. You don't want to do it when you got three kids. Um, you know, I hear people going back to school after they've had a, you know, they got kids in school, and that's that's good. But you know, that's when you need to do that at this age. Um, I love to see when I'm training. I love to see guy kids out in the you know, sitting out in front of me that are 18, 19, and they're just ready to get it. You can always tell the ones though. You know what I mean? You can tell the ones that want to get after it. They're asking all the questions. They're coming up to you during break. Like, what's this do? What's that do? You know? Yeah. So yeah, man, that's crazy. I mean, so when did you get back? Are you settled in now or are you... <laughs> Yeah, well, that was a while ago. That was right. uh, yeah, 10 years ago now. Like, it's been a while, maybe 11. Um, and because of refrigeration, I was making piles of money. I was traveling to all the countries over there. Uh, so there's no excuse. If you want to, you got to put the time in, though. 
Like I saved up thirty or forty thousand dollars or fifty thousand. I can't even remember how much I saved before I left. I had a pile of money uh, because I was just hoard, not hoarding it, but I was making so much because I was working so hard um, seven days a week, a lot of times for months and months. And um, I was reckless with my money too, and I still had that much. And my the toss up was buy a house or go traveling. So I made the decision to go travel instead of buying a house. Would it have been a better decision to buy a house at the time? Maybe, but probably um, not. No, I think that's overrated. Think that's overrated too. Yeah, <laughs> that's overrated too. Yeah, I was gonna say you coming up on 08 here. We're talking about this. Not a, probably not a good time to buy a house. Yeah. So, so then, um, then I moved uh, moved to a couple other countries and stayed for a bit. But then moved back to Canada, did some work, and then I knew I wanted to. Me and my wife were gonna start having kids, so we moved back closer to the family here in Ontario. And, um, so we were staying here for a bit. I was working as a technician and, you know, just working, doing my thing, service, supermarket, which I, I loved, right? I love troubleshooting. I love figuring out problems. love talking to customers, you know, uh, you know, seeing the smile on their face, like shit, man, I had three people here and you finally fixed it, you know? Right. Uh, that's a great feeling. Or getting a call from the service manager saying, Hey, I just got a call from that, uh, uh, customer and they were like so pleased you come in you're clean you know you're not all dirty and you talk to them properly um, you made sense when you explain the problem to them that they could kind of understand it and right. they just want you to go back the next time you know that's such a great feeling um, and always made me want to work a little harder to get that you know um, and then uh, I was working the, the 14 hours so I was living out outside of the away from Toronto, but I was doing on call into Toronto. So any city it's like doing on call in New York or <laughs> LA, you know right. what I mean? Toronto is a big city. So I was doing on call down there and I was just, I'm like, nah, I'm not digging this. So, uh, an opportunity for a job came up, um, uh, for a company called Emerson and didn't know who Emerson was at all. But then I found out they, they own Copeland. I knew right. Copeland real well. <laughs> you know, I worked on lots of those compressors. I'm like, okay, so I'm like, okay, I'm going to try for this, this role, you know, and it's always scary, you know, getting outside your comfort zone, but this is what I really, my most successful times in my life is getting outside my comfort zone, That's you know, the doing the things that, uh, you know, yep. that make you feel like, shit, am I doing the right thing? Am I not doing the right thing? Um, it feels weird. Uh, you're scared, uh, but I did it. I was like, I'm not going to get this job. I was talking negative you should be talking positively like i'm gonna get this job that's what i should have been saying but i got it and um that was back in 2014 i think and so i started there as a business development manager and the role was um to go around and talk with contractors about different solutions they had so electronic valves digital compressors variables all this different uh the different uh, energy solution low condensing and so i would go to these contractors and start teaching and educating either the technicians or some of the salespeople and kind of enjoyed it. You know, I'd, I'd love talking with technicians, you know, even when I was uh, yep. coming up, I'd always try to share my knowledge. Um, but I didn't know how much I did like that. So I was doing that for two or three years, just making moves, learning, studying, diving into everything Emerson has. Cause I got a full portfolio of everything refrigeration. They're probably one of the largest refrigeration manufacturers in the world. Right, because they got compressors, they got controls, they got industrial, they got commercial, residential, you name it, they they got it all. And I spent years learning in and outs of the technical side, the sales side, the energy side, uh, just to brush myself up. So uh, when I was out talking to uh, these companies and these technicians, that I I knew my shit. You know what I mean? Right. Um, yeah. But I'm still learning. You know, I, I still I'm still learn, learning. But after about three years, I like I went to my boss and I'm like listen, man, I'm really enjoying this training stuff. Like we got to do something. We got to like, uh, like make a training role or something. So he was like, yeah, this is a good idea. So came up kind of with a plan on what to do. And then, uh, after about two and a half, three years, we turned myself into like the lead HVAC and refrigeration, uh, trainer for Canada. And, uh, from there it was, uh, I was crushing it. I had some people on the team that they, they trained different areas, but I was, I was heading up all the training. So when I first started there, they did, I think about six trainings a year, all ad hoc, no structure to it. 
2019, before the pandemic, we did 76 trainings within a That's four or five year good. period. We yeah, were awesome. We were smashing out a lot of training, structured training, you know, one day, two day, three day trainings, lots of different stuff. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun there. They educated me. I learned from all the experts at Copeland. So I know quite a bit about compressors. But what I was doing at the same time uh, is because I was motivated because I wanted to learn everything. I was learning about Bitzer. I was learning about Sporlin. I was learning about all the other manufacturers as well because I wanted to make sure that I knew what I was talking about. Yep. And if you got to compare this to that, you got to know how the other one works. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, for me, all the big manufacturers out there, even when I worked at Emerson, they all make good equipment, like the big ones. Like they put a lot of money in research and development. I've been at a lot of manufacturers. I trained so many manufacturers, so many wholesalers, so many technicians, contractors, but the, the big ones, they, they put some money into their equipment. Like you may get some equipment that doesn't work and you're frustrated and you're like DOA and this is crap and blah, 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 blah. But yeah. they spend a lot of time. They're probably selling millions of those equipment and you get one or, or two of the, thou, you know, a few thousands that are right. their issue, right? And it happens. Bad day, someone's wiring it. They, they make a mistake in a wiring. It happens. You need to own it up and just stop blaming everyone. You know what I mean? Fix the problem. We're a technician. Sort it out. If it's not running, why is it not running? And figure it out. That's our job. Don't complain for four hours. You know what I mean? Now, have you have you talked or been and on the side where – turned off the podcast right now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no. 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 no, I did it before. No, We're all no, looking I... in the mirror going, God, that's me. Yep, that's me. I have did it before, so I'm not going to lie. Oh, I've yeah. done it before, but what's what, – well, We've all been there for sure. What do you get out of it? You know, cursing and complaining, kicking the equipment, nothing. It just means that you're staying later on Friday night to fix it. Well, so so me and Ryden were on, you know, I came from the field and then we, we went on the distribution side and I was on tech support on that side. And, you know, I'd get these calls from these guys like this is DOA and they just, they just show back up at the branch with the unit. Like yeah. I need a new unit. So when I was in the field, like I didn't know that was an option, right? I remember going – Oh, this is DOA. Well, what's wrong with it? Oh, okay. Well, let me order a compressor. And this thing's like four hours old, you know? I didn't think to unsweat the unit and bring it back. Like, <laughs> I want to fix the damn thing. Like, yeah. it's probably like, it, so at the end of the day, right, everything on that thing is a part. And they sell that part. Yeah. So I'm like, if you got the part, let me get the part and I'll put it on, you know? Um it's not killing the life, you know, I just don't believe it kills the lifespan. You do it properly. You change it properly. You know, you're, you're, I, mean, I don't want to be changing out a reversing valve on a, on a unit that's four hours old, but, um, I might, if you don't, you know, <laughs> I yeah. mean, I just didn't, you know what I mean? At that time, I just remember wanting to fix it. And now I feel like it's just like, no, nah, we need a new one. Um, well, it's everyone, get, everyone's got that Amazon mentality about everything now. Yeah, you know? I mean, at the end of the day, you said it. We're, we're techs, right? We need to you try to figure out and fix it. But I was going to ask you if you were ever on the side on Emerson and, and where compressors come back and how many do you think, or do they test them, right? I've heard dude, they test them. Dude. It's, it's oh, not man. good, right? Oh, it's not oh, good. <laughs> I've inspected hundreds even thousands of compressors over the years because i was in the labs with the experts these guys inspected tens of thousands some of the guys that i work with one guy's 40 years inspecting uh just (laughs) making making the compressors from scratch like he would put them together so these guys are experts and there are so many times because i over the years I, i built some relationships with contractors they would send 60 compressors back and uh, I would send them pictures of it running on the table, and they're crying on the phone because they just, they just charge a customer twenty five thousand for a replacement or twenty thousand. You know what I mean? And the compressor's running. Um, if it's a what do you, what do you think the percentage is? Just your, you know? Oh, I know the percentage is for most manufacturers is over thirty percent. There's nothing wrong with them that come oh, back. Wow. I've yeah. I've there's so many like because I used to do all the compressor trainings and I'd have say if I had 20 techs I'd have 20 different compressors out there and they'd be inspecting them 
and probably half of them a lot of times I could turn them on and run them right there <laughs> you know and scroll compressors like it's all they're built by machines like there's less than two percent of the 200 million scrolls that that Copa make and then the hundreds and hundreds of millions of the other manufacturers make it's all done by machines so the non-compliance they call or doa is two percent so if you have a scroll that's a doa it's usually I was say, the if way, what, what do you usually see that it is if it is a doa it's just so if it's a single yeah, phase yeah, a, lot, yeah, a lot of times it's it's wiring wrong you know, I've oh, seen it yeah. so many times. It could have happened at the manufacturer who's putting the compressor in there or even from the Cobalt manufacturer. I've even seen that where it's wired wrong and the technician doesn't take the time just to even look at the wire. Um, yep, that's that for does. single phase. Uh, for, for three phase, um, I've seen it before. There's some, some devices in certain compressors. Like there's one device called the ASTP, Advanced uh, Scroll Temperature Protector. What it does, it shuts the compressor down when it... Uh, runs too hot and so all of a sudden the compressor is running but it won't pump and you're like dead oh it's doa but it's it's running but it won't pump so you think inside so to cut them out and send them back but really the internals inside was protecting it because you wired it wrong you got too much hot gas bypassing your uh, your valve is not set up properly whatever it is you don't get enough gas in in the system while you're I actually i've actually experienced that this summer this past summer on on the tech support side for a uh um it was a rude seven and a half ton rooftop and it was the uh t- is a two yeah it's a two-stage copeland um yeah it's running but it's not pumping and you hear it running um, but you know it's got that giant sticker right on the side that tells you that it's doing that <laughs> but yeah. um yeah they almost uh you know wanted to pull that off the roof but um of course, just it really it, understand it be an airflow right always yeah. <laughs> you gotta understand though, i've done so much compressor training and like i've talked to thousands of technicians and most of them didn't even know there was compressor manuals like every compressor every scroll compressor there's a specific manual for it because i used to think um you know i'm working on a scroll oh the scroll is a scroll that's it Right. No, it's not. There's, they make 27, almost 30 different scrolls now. That's just Copeland. Then you got Danfoss, you got LG, you got Tecumseh. You, you know what I mean? And each one of right. those have a manual. So just because one runs in with one parameters and one set of conditions and certain refrigerant doesn't mean the other one can. Yep. <laughs> so it's just that education thing and, and spending the time to learn. I've read, uh, I'm. I, I guess I can say I'm an expert at Copeland, uh, com- uh, semi hermetics, and scrolls because I read every one of those manuals multiple times. Right. You know, and that's it. That's what you got to do. You got to read, see it in the field, use the apps, use the manuals. And it doesn't matter if it's Bitzer, Copeland, whoever the compressor is. You just got to spend some time, find the manuals, read it, invest a little bit more time, see them in the field. Take all the parameters. Like, that's another big one. I used to do tech support, and I can just imagine Dennis did the tech support. What's your superheat? It's good. What What does good mean? I never heard of good superheat. Yeah. <laughs> What's I your need, voltage? It's good. Yep. I need some pressures and temperatures. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm not going to – I know tech support guys get beat up, you know. Oh, yeah. I couldn't get a hold of them. They never answer. He was mad. As, he was pissed off. He was rude. He was, um, and you call that tech support guy and you're like, man, what, what did you say to him? Well, I mean, I asked him what is super heat, what is sub cool is. And <laughs> he said it was good. And I said, well, sweet. And we hung up the phone, you know, like, I don't yeah. know. It's, um, so yeah, I was going to say you jump, you jump right in there. Um, this is, I seen this come up on, uh, achr news but give me your take on superheat because i talk about superheat a lot in my trainings because i feel like everybody's so and when i say trainings right we're talking residential split systems package units um i train a lot i'm pretty heavy on that side but i feel like those guys are so driven on subcool because everything's a subcool charging chart, right? TXV, but 
Super Heat gets overlooked like crazy. Oh yeah, it doesn't it say right on side of those units. Like I've installed a couple of it, a couple of residential units, and I couldn't believe how simple it was because they put all the information there. Over the years, I've installed so many pieces of equipment, and I didn't have the information to say to tell me. Right. You know, I was going with the guidelines, but I've I've done a few. I think it was a, maybe a Lennox and a York, and it said right on the side. If it's this temperature out, this is the subcooling you need. This is the superheat you need. This is the amps, and that's it. Like I couldn't believe, <laughs> couldn't believe how it's, like they put all the information right there in front of me. To be now, honest, with you. since you're a Copeland guy, so the last last couple years, I've, I on in tech support, I was getting some calls on some scroll plates breaking. Um. And I, you know, I almost feel like guys aren't really changing how they've been charging, right? They turn the jug over, um, they fire it up, they let it, you know, they're running it through the suction side. Now it's straight liquid, you know, that's what it says on the jug. You got to turn the jug over. And I feel like you can hear them there. They sound a little different. I know Copeland's having to become more efficient. So what what is your take on that? I've I've seen some come back and they are just grenaded inside. I just had another one this week. First one, this first one. Yeah, one off. something's I changed, but I don't. I can't put my finger on it. Right? I mean, so you, so you actually cut them open and looked inside? Oh yeah, I always cut them open. a yeah. boy, love it. I love um, it. Too. I got some pretty rough videos where there's just so you got the plate that the scroll plates sit on. Mm-hmm. A spiral, and there's nothing there. It's flat, <laughs> and all the shit's in the bottom, right? Yep. So you can see where they're welded on there. You can see the little line. You know, the, it's the spiral lines, but the, the the plates are gone. Yeah. Um. And you know, I talk, and, and some of these techs are because uh, I'm. I mean, shit, I'm a Copeland scroll fan i mean you can't kill that thing right i mean it's probably still running just not pumping what's going on oh it's running actually it was running (laughs) yeah they're tough it was running there's yeah Yeah, no no pumping but yeah um i had i had a guy at the factory tell me not not it was the manufacturer the brand not copeland but yeah um they said yeah these guys are killing them with liquid and i'm thinking man you know this guy's charging this unit like he's always charged it for 20 years. Um, and he actually said, you know what? We may we may have to start coming out with a like a uh, a charge restrictor, right? Where you don't, you turn the jug over and then, uh, which I've never used one, but um, it actually kind of flashes it back to gas. Yeah, to, yellow jacket sell them. A lot of manual. Yeah. It's just an quarter inch i mean is that something you think we we got to start easing towards i mean because the compressor's definitely changed yeah i, I don't, don't think i don't think it's um so it, it happened on startup is that what you're saying the guys are charging and it fails in startup or it runs for a little while and then fails Usually so i've had a many bit and some yeah, yeah i mean i've had them do it in in six hours you know the, the homeowner here you know they, they charged it up they left the homeowner said it got really loud and when the tech gets back over there, he's like, man, this thing's pumping rocks. You know, it's just sounds like shit. Yeah. And we get it back. I cut it open. You know, do you see the startup report? <laughs> 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 right? Very startup. funny. Very funny. Yeah, well, and that's the other problem, guy. right? Yeah. That's the other <laughs> problem Jeez. in residential is yeah. what's that? We got, it's all still the same commercial residential but on the residential side i just don't feel like th- that's there like that I mean, yeah yeah so i don't know they they may have changed you know, who knows they might have changed stuff but most likely that's system related issues 100 percent. you know what i mean right. it's not that the parts are any any worse like people are just beating them more and more <laughs> that that's it right people don't understand it's either slugging flood back oil issues you know how are they piping it are they just pulling the copper through the roof or are they sloping it properly you know there's so many different things that we could talk about what was the superheat like you're saying like what was that compressor superheat at the end of the day um 
Has the crank? What did they start? Did the crankcase eater run for twelve hours before they started it up? Yep, I knew you were going to say that, and <laughs> and that's almost in every heat pump manual, right? I've been telling guys, look, level the pad, set the unit on it, go ahead and get power to it, and then start the install. You know what I mean? Um, at at least do that. I know the brand I'm training on now recommends at least an hour um crankcase but if you're dealing with a shitload of refrigerant right like uh i don't know a 10 20 ton pack uh, i probably an hour is not going to do it i wouldn't think but well it all depends right is it outside is the system already outside in the sun like it the the big thing is like if you look in bitzer they give an actual temperature they went to oil before you okay you start charging Copeland just says 12 hours Really, you need warm. You want warm oil so you don't have flooded starts. Right. That's the, that's the big thing. Is it two hours? Is it twelve hours? Is it, they they just say twelve hours because they know for sure that's safe. You know what I mean? Right. But if it's not wired properly, or if you get back feed through the compressor somehow when you power it up, and someone pulls an evacuation on it, then you're going to burn out the compressor. What well, too? So there, there's there's lots of things that you need to think about. Uh, cause I've seen that before I was doing a training last night and a guy told me that they had to change their process of manufacture because they had that happen. They turned on the crank case heaters earlier and then there was back feed through the back three feed through the, the windings, windings. Okay. and caused uh, a compressor failure during the evacuation. Right. So huh. <laughs> lots of things to think about, but it's all, once again, doesn't matter whose compressor it is, it's about who's installing it. Right. The compressor will last 20 years um, if it's installed properly. Like outside my house right now, I got a 1991 Keep Right, and it's still running amazing. What the heck is a Keep Right? Yeah, well, you know what a Keep Right is, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's it's 30 years old and it's just still running. People, oh, you can get more efficiency out of it. Well. Maybe it's the equipment's not not were as good as it used to be because they it is the metal's not the same. You know that. You no, know, right. they used to yeah. build Opera's tanks. The same. No, it is. They built tanks back in the day. Um, well, the rule back then was if this thing breaks, we're not going to be able to sell them. Yeah. So right, like like appliances. Appliances have taken a huge shit. Oh uh, yeah. But back in the day, it was like. If this thing fails, we'll never be able to sell another one. So they just built them like that. Um, now they're like, we got to sell just, we got to just sell more of them. That's what we got to do. You know, if they break, we just sell them another one. But yeah, so the parts back then, I don't know. I, I think, I think new equipment is, I don't want to say, I, I think it is better, right? It's obviously more efficient. We can, we can do a lot more with it. Um, you know, that, that 30 year old system, you walk into a house, it's like in the, in the summertime, you put it on 68 just to be comfortable. Cause it's got a piston in it and the grills are wet. I mean, you know, there's a whole lot of shit going on there. That's yeah. not good. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's satisfied the thermostat, but, um, you know, it's 68 with 68% humidity in the house sure. you know <laughs> it's yeah, just yeah. oh yeah it's not so that that takes me to my next question what is your what's your pick an eev or a txv oh for me hands down eev um go. just because i've been yep. using them for years and it's just so they're so easy so smooth um well and they don't know, break right i just never had one fail no, they. I swear. Once again, it's like any piece of equipment. We break it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we break it. We cause it to fail. Um, and I talked about like I trained on so much Emerson electronic valves, but I was, I got great friends at Sporlin and Corel and Dan Foss, and we always talked, even when I was at Emerson. And the way theirs failed, failed exactly the same as Emerson, <laughs> same the same as Sporlin, same right. as any other manufacturer. It's you know, contamination or parameters aren't set up or wrong voltage or just something that we, we do in the field. Uh, and that just comes with knowledge and experience. I feel like what drives it or, you know, what the signal we get is usually what fails, right? That thermistor 
I feel like thermistors still are not up to par with an EEV. Um, some some manufacturers do pretty good on the thermistors, but um, that's There's a pretty so many different. That's, ones. that's a pretty fine tuned little device. You know, it don't take much to screw it up. Yeah, no, like Emerson sells dozens of different thermistors, right? And I remember doing a test with one of the um, CPC experts, and he put them, he showed me them, he put them all in the oven, heated them all up, and then cooled them all down, and they have all different response rates. So you can't just take a 10K sensor and just put it in somewhere if you don't know the, the rate of it, the speed of it, because they're different. Not all 10Ks okay. are the same. Same with PT1000s. They're not all the same. They have different response rates. So when you're at like 10K, it should be, what is it again? Um, 10K is like 75 degrees, for example. I think that's what it is. But when you start to warm it up and say it's a NTC, it starts to either speed the speed down those uh, ohms. So when you get right. your, your meter on it, you see it dropping really quick. But you could have another one and it's a more slower response. So you do the exact same test and all of a sudden it doesn't drop as fast. And I've been seeing, I've seen that so much over the years. Oh, I just grabbed this one. I put it in. Should be working. It's 10K. No. Well, it's, that's maybe why your issues are happening. I've seen that so right. much. Yeah, I think the, I mean, what do you, so what do you think about the new, the new generation of technician with, with as fast as all this is moving? Um, you know, we've, we've been talking about it on the show about these schools. Um, you know, how do you feel about a school going to a school or do you think just going right out into the field and hitting it? I mean, what's your take on that? For a trade school? You mean? Yeah. I mean, you want, you hundred percent guys you should need go to, take to as much school as possible, even if it's shitty. Right. <laughs> it's an experience. That's it's true. an experience. I've done so much school and I didn't even notice this. I I think it was a year or two ago. I kind of started thinking about all you need to reflect. All you technicians out there, reflect on the shit you did and be proud of all the stuff you accomplished. And if you're in the industry for 10 years, you did a lot of shit. But we don't think right. about it because we're always putting out fires, we're at the next job, or chasing chasing more dollars or whatever it is. You gotta stop and reflect. So I was reflecting on the training I've done over the years. I couldn't even count on my two hands. There were so many that I've done um, without even thinking I was doing it. And now I realize that I was, this is why I'm so good at what I do is I just continued to learn and slowly, it wasn't like I learned every, cause that I used to think, Oh, I need to learn this now, now, now. But now that I look back after 20 years or 18 years of doing this is like, it was a slow progress to get to this point. Because I'd take a course here, I'd go to a school here, I'd get a ticket here, i do something else here. Personal development, that's another big one. I'm trying to teach more technicians because I do a lot of training. Huge on personal development now. That was really a game changer uh, when I started going in and learning how to speak to people properly. Learn how to write an email. Learn how to... Um, <laughs> Uh, really I'm still working on that. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that changes, right? I feel, you, you get people now that send you an email. You're like, Oh, I like how that guy just sent his. Maybe I start doing mine like that. I feel like that's kind of a, a fad thing. Everybody changes a little up a little bit. Um, I, can't, I can't stand when they put everything in a font. That's almost impossible to read, but they just think it looks cool. I don't know. I'm a pretty big Those, font guy, man. I like to change the fonts up. Yeah, but bit. when like they send it and it all looks like hand script, you're like, <laughs> really? Just write me a note or type it how I can read it. I was going to say, tell us about this 30-day video challenge for some guys that don't know about that. Yeah, so what I like to do is I like to challenge myself and get outside my comfort zone. Before I started Refrigeration Mentor, my business is that I knew I needed to – get in front of the camera and it's something that I wasn't comfortable with. Right. But I know if I want to educate millions of refrigeration professionals out there, um, and this is what I'm trying to change the, the technician word <laughs> into refrigeration professional. Cause that's what we're at. We are, um, right. I need to get in front of a camera. And so this 30 days challenge is really getting me in there, talking more about motivational stuff, you know, how to get better at what you do. Like three or four years ago, I used to say, can't read i don't and i didn't 
because I kept telling myself, oh, I'm not a reader. I, I had to read the paragraph over and over and over and over again until I finally got it. You know what I mean? Right. Now I can read 10 times faster. I know how to learn. I, I read, I'm read. i going to read over 20 books this year, where three or four years ago, I read no books a year, like manuals <laughs> and stuff. You know what I mean? But I am. Yeah, I would rather read a install manual than like a just a story. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'd rather, but yeah, no, that's big time. Yeah, there's I, one I book, I got it. a ton, ton of them here. And three, like I said, three or four years ago, I had none. But there's one called uh, Jim Quick, Limitless is called. He taught me how to learn. Like we're not taught in school how to learn. So he taught me how to read faster. Another guy named Tim Ferriss, the four hour work week. So I'm, I learned, they taught me how to read. Like I knew how to read, but how to read and in, kind of enjoy it because I can read fast. Now, because before I was reading one word at a time. And now now I just read. You don't have to. It's like when you drive up to a stop sign. You you sit there and you read it or you just know it's a stop sign. That's how I read now. It took I me years you. to do it and I'm still learning. Uh, I want to get to a point where I read a maybe a book a day or I could. You know what I mean? Not there yet, but I will get there because my mind's set at it. And... Spending the time to do the hard things. Reading was hard for me, but now I spent three years doing it. I can, I can read. Now I feel like we need to uh, sit down and write out a book list for for guys. Yeah, it's post on Instagram. I know. Yeah, we, books we for books that I for text. right now. There's only there's uh, the Yes Attitude, uh, Jim Quick Limitless, uh, Earl Nightingale, uh, Essential of Success, uh, Stephen Covey. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Atomic Habits, or James Clear, Mastery by Robert Greene, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yeah, that's a classic. That one in the... That, that's a classic. My favorite one's Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. I read that's that very good too. twice this year. <laughs> maybe three times. God, I feel terrible. I haven't read any of these. A good oh, quick whatever. one that I, I loved is a Rhinoceros Success. That's a good, real quick read, but it's really to the point. So I let Ryden read them, and then he tells me all the good stuff in them. Well, I, if I don't do <laughs> something like that, then I would have nothing to bring to this conversation because I just sit back here and I'm, oh, all right. It just goes in my head some days. Now, I can sit and I know what all these parts and pieces are, and I, and I know all the things we're talking about, but my brain doesn't connect it as fast as you guys did because the bulk of my field experience was either rough in tons of duck well, you work, were a big duck work guy. Yeah. like i was now commercial duck work residential duck work all that that was my thing but i i never really got into the service side or even a whole bunch of startup stuff because most of the time when i was working was in the summers and where do you throw the high school kid to be effective in the attic or in the crawl space <laughs> <laughs> right. um you know and then by the time i was I was older in school. I was out selling rather than installing anymore. So I kind of, there's, there's a lot of that field stuff. I skip. That's why I have Dennis in my life. So he can inform me and fill in the gaps. There you go. Yeah. That's what you so do. Trevor, what are you, what are you into right now? Like what's your, as far as work wise, what are you into right now? Oh, great question. Um, so right now my business is growing real fast. Um, I'm trying to learn how to hire people. I hired somebody last week, two people. Um, and my business is all around training, education, and mentorship. So this is what I'm focusing on, helping educate millions of refrigeration professionals around the world. Um, and Sweet. Uh, okay. that's my goal, to really get people to where they want to be in a shorter time in refrigeration. When I started out, I didn't really have any coaches or mentors and like, a lot of the guys I work with were the same age as me. You know, there was a few that were older than me and, you know, they kind of guided me, but it wasn't like someone that really was there mentoring me. I just went in, I did my work and I was figuring things out a lot on my own. I remember like second year, um, I was doing construction the whole time. And then all of a sudden, okay, you're on call. I'm like on call. I've never done service before, you know? <laughs> And, right. uh, and I was just thrown to the wolves. And I know that's still the way it is. A lot of people are there. 
And it took me a long time, to be honest. Like I did on call for five, six, seven years, and I wasn't comfortable doing it. I didn't feel confident because I, I had lots of experience, but it was just me figuring out, right? Breaking stuff and figuring out, no, don't do that again, you know? And, right. Um, <laughs> and, then, uh, and then I got to my six or seven, and then I was comfortable doing it. But I want to help technicians out there, refrigeration professionals out there, instead of them having to struggle for like 10 years, kind of like I did, it's right. like, okay, let's do this in three or four years, five years. And it's not going to, it doesn't work for everyone. Like a lot of my programs are not for new people, like people that are two or three years in. I, right. I have some technicians that come in that are age, but they're more eager. They want to learn. Um, but a lot well, of that's my- that's it. That's how they, that's, that's what you have to be. I yeah. mean, if you want to learn, you got to want to learn it. Yeah, I mean, exactly. So a lot of my trains for experienced technicians. So it's continuing education because there was none really for me. There wasn't a lot uh, where you could go as your seasoned technician, you get 10, 12 years. There's no real places for you to go get education. And this is what Refrigeration Mentor is all about. It's about teaching and education, experienced technicians to really help them because yes, they know a lot. They Half of them know more than me, but they come for refresher. They come right. for the conversations. They come to learn a little bit, find out what is going on out there. And my goal is to make them one or 2% better, you know, over the four or six or eight week courses that I put on uh, because I develop a lot of programs for contractors and I work with contractors building uh, technical programs or uh, leadership programs. And I try to really talk to technicians to, to help them understand that you need to do more than just your technical side of it. Uh, because when you get 35, 40 years old, like me and a lot of people that I've seen, and you did it for 20 years, and you didn't do any training, you didn't do any personal development, you didn't do any growth, and you're like, fuck, what do I do now? Right. You know, <laughs> yeah. all I do is uh, technical stuff, and I'm awesome at it, but I don't want to be slugging compressors anymore. You know what I mean? I don't want to be carrying the pipe. I don't want to be doing 14-hour days. What do I do? And they're stuck. And these are the technicians that I really want to help and guide them. Yes, it might be 40. It might be 30. But there's lots of opportunities still. You still got 50 years of your life. Let's figure it out and work together to get where you're at. And this is why I own my own business now. It's because I understand that I need to make a shift. I didn't want to be on the tools anymore. That first shift was to Emerson. And now my next shift is really to help millions of people out there, serve them. So not only on the technical side, but on the personal development side, because I do a lot of coaching as well. I coach people one-on-one. I do mentoring. Um, but my goal is to really help people that are stuck to move on. Because personally, I don't believe um, technicians should stay as a technician their whole career. Some some will. They love it. But I think if you do the personal development stuff you can, and you learn some stuff, you can get into sales, project management, wholesale, manufacturing. Oh, There's yeah, so man. much opportunity out there. Um, and I yep. think we need to do a better job as an industry talking outwards, talking to the public about why refrigeration is so great because we're good at talking internally. Like us, we're having a great conversation. You're, we're talking to a bunch of technicians that are listening to this and refrigeration professionals, which is great. But we're right. not super good at talking to the public about it. And we need to get a, a stream of technicians who are transitioning from as a a refrigeration professional technician into the sales, project manager, engineering roles, whatever, business owners, and then getting more younger people to come in to fill those spots, to do that five, six, 10 years of the, you know, being in the field, learning those hands-on skills. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, well, I that, say, that's why, that's why we keep pushing and really got into building our show and and doing social media and and trying to bring these other things because there's just this huge stigma of of the trades for anyone you know under 35 or 40 and even some in the 40s it's just they they look down upon the trades when they don't realize how much money there is to be made there how much opportunity is to be there and how many just good people are trades people yeah um well i think it's crazy what you know, I, me, I'm on the manufacturer's rep side now, and how many techs don't know that that side exists, right? Yeah. How what the jobs that are available on the distrib, you know, distribution side, you know, like where Ryden is, and I was tech support, and 
I mean, I remember hitting that wall. I was 10 years in, which isn't a long time, but if you worked with one guy and you did 10 calls a day and two installs that day, I mean, you basically did, I basically did 20 years worth of shit in 10 years. And I, you hit that wall and I said, I cannot work in the field anymore. Like it's not fun anymore. It's not enjoyable. You know, it's just another grind. Yep. And, but you've put all that time in, you don't just go get something else, right? You got to stay in the trade, but there's so many things to get into, man. I, I can't believe how many jobs there is in this industry that you can just float into if you got some experience, you know? Oh yeah. Oh, there's so much opportunity and you can grow inside those, those businesses. You can start your own company there. And, and this is it. Once again, it's about knowledge and education. Um, people don't know the avenues. And this is another thing that I'm working with a lot of contractors and I'm trying to teach them about culture inside your organization and training them because I've, I've talked to CEOs and owners of big companies and they're like, but if I train them, Trevor, they're just going to leave. So I'm just spending all this money. Well, what happens if you don't train them? And what if yeah. you train them properly and they fill that role of a new, another sales guy who can go out and sell them more equipment? What about if you can fill that role of a project manager who can now take care of business and you train him? What about if you, you train them and now they're a service manager, general manager, operation manager? There's so much opportunity. The problem is... I've seen it time and time again. Contractors, they're technicians. We need them in the field. We're, we're low on staff. Get them out there. You got to think differently. You got to, they're not thinking yeah. long term. That's short term thinking. Yeah, that's really. reactive for yeah. sure. Yep. And um, we, we see that on, on every side, not just the contractor side. It's crazy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I worked for that guy. <laughs> I worked for that guy. And it's like when you're in it in the summer, you don't realize that's happening, you know, and you get it, you get out and you get away and you're like, damn, we were just spinning our wheels over there. Um, but 10 years flies by or five years, they're not growing. You know, there's a million HVAC companies out there doing that for sure. Yeah. Well, I change um, after, after, for me, after two or three years, I changed companies, not because, um, I it was some good companies too, not because I, had any issues with anyone or anything like that. It was really that I needed to learn more. You know, right. I needed to grow. And I highly recommend that to technicians as well. Some people are like, oh, why would you do that if it's real good? Well, because other c- companies do it differently. In yeah, some- but what does real good mean, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what, yeah. what does that mean? I mean, it's not greener it, on the other side either, for sure. It's <laughs> No, you're just learning different cultures. You're, yeah. um, you're getting more well, well-rounded, you know? networking i think that's the big one of the biggest thing is networking like i got i got good friends that are in this industry for life for sure all over the world you know and it's just like a community of like professionals and it's nice to see it we're not that big there's 15 20 million people in refrigeration around the world so we're not a big um a big industry for refrigeration right. professionals so we need to work together to grow it uh, there's so much opportunity out there. That's it's crazy. There's just so much um, in our industry, and anyone who does refrigeration and has has good skills, I, there's hundreds of people looking for you right now. Manufacturers are looking for you. Distributors are looking for you. Contractors are looking for you. They'll fly you, move you. Some contractors will move you if you got the skill, especially refrigeration, specifically refrigeration commercial too. Right. Um, Man, I know some companies right now that, you know, they've been looking for years for good techs, you know, and willing to pay. And so, but once again, it's what you put in is what you get out. If you're going to put in the work, uh, you're going to get it out, right? You see that. So what are are you, uh, are you going, are you doing any training on all the new, the new stuff coming out, you know, January all the new mandates and all that are you no does that not, really affect uh refrigeration i wouldn't think it would no, but. no it does affect uh, i i know a lot of stuff about all of it but my goal is to help people like my big program right now is co2 refrigeration this is something that's coming to north america very fast i'm trying to right. prepare people contractors technicians but my three core programs right now are 
uh, really compressor compressor training, um, supermarket training, and uh, CO2 training. So learning programs, and these are designed, customized programs to really get those experienced technicians either to the next level, good refresher, or uh, really grow their knowledge on some of the new technologies um, that I'm involved in, and really help them. You know, get the, their comfort level up, their confidence up. Uh, and uh, kick ass out there when they're out in the field, right? Sweet. Oh, yeah, I'm all about some training, man. That's what I do. I've, I've been training three days a week here lately. Yeah, awesome. Um, so what is your go-to podcast? Do you listen to podcasts? Oh, I listen to a lot of uh, <laughs> I figured people. you did. <laughs> How long do you want to talk here? You know, I know. <laughs> I've now, actually, what's your go-to if you had a – let's say you had a couple-hour drive somewhere. What's your go-to? Okay, I listen to a few different ones. Um, if it's on the technical side, um, I listen to Advanced Refrigeration Podcast and uh, Brian Orr's uh, HVAC School. Yep, um, I like Brian Orr. I listen to them a lot. But if I go on my personal development, I listen to uh, Motivate is one called uh, Mind Valley, The Diary of a CEO, like a lot of mindset stuff, to be honest okay. with you. Yeah. Uh, Jim Quick. Like th- those are the podcasts that I'm usually listening to. The technical ones I'll, I'll listen to if I'm on a long drive. I'll throw Brian on and just listen to a, you know, a podcast because they get a pile of them. Um, but right. mostly it's personal development podcasts. You know, um, Jim Rohn, uh, Zig Ziglar, uh, a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff just to get my mindset right because there's a lot of negativity out there. There's a lot of self-doubt. To be, you know what I mean? It's like, Yep. I, I need help because I'm trying to grow a massive enterprise, massive company and trying to change the world uh, for our industry. And, uh, you know, days can be tough. And it can be lonely as a, as a business owner, but that helps me, pushes me through. I listen to that stuff at the gym and everything. I used to lift, listen to a lot of all music and stuff, but now it's, to be honest, just personal development stuff. So I tried to work out the other day listening to some technical stuff i'm gonna have to work on that you got you do have to get your mind right um when i hit the gym i'm still a music guy but um if i'm just like walking on the treadmill or jogging or something i can do i can listen to uh you know somebody working on a compressor for you know an hour i can do that but um if I'm lifting weights, man, I can't listen to technical information. I can't. <laughs> I can't get in it. Yeah, um, sure. But if you're, uh, you know, it is what it is. So what's your, what's your, uh, if you do music, what's your music, what's your downloads? What's your playlist? What do you like? Um, I I listen to a lot of different stuff. Um, if I'm at the gym, it's usually something harder. Um could be Guns N' Roses, ACDC, Metallica, uh, Pearl Jam, something like that, 90s. Sweet. Uh, metal, okay. Or, okay. or it's like high beats, like uh, some sort of uh, house music or something like that. Right. Yeah. All right. So you got to think about your walkout song. Yeah. Yeah. No, I will. <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll come up with a good one. We'll see. You got time. Um, so cool, man. Well, yeah, we appreciate you coming on the show. Um, is there anything you else you want to throw in there for yeah. your your yeah, company? I say, you want definitely, to, definitely yeah. give a plug on some of your classes you've got going up. I know you do some where to find uh, some free yeah. event stuff, but uh, yeah, throw that out there too. Yeah, no, I love it. I really appreciate that. Thank you for having me on. Like, yeah, for sure. Head out to refrigerationmentor.com. dot um, I'm launching a new website there in the next few weeks um, to make it understandable a bit more last year I, I built one but i got a new uh, website coming out refrigerationmentor.com you can hit me up on linkedin instagram facebook youtube um but some of the courses i have i got a super i'm, I'm running a, a co2 refrigeration course right now which is really cool i have some, some amazing technicians across north america and actually they could probably train it uh, i got a supermarket course coming up I got a, in the new year, I'm going to have another compressor, compressor master class coming up, another supermarket commercial refrigeration, uh, just a lot of cool things. 
and yeah, if you're at the AHR show, I'm doing five podcasts. I think um, I'm doing a couple of meet and greets. I'm actually doing a CO2 seminar. So anybody that's in refrigeration, my first educational session at the AHR show, I'm, I'm super pumped about that. Sweet. I'll be at, um, in January, I'll be at the HVAC school symposium, the training symposium there doing a couple, couple conversations. Every Monday I do something called CO2 Mondays. I was only going to do it for, I think 12 weeks, I'm on 30 some weeks. People just say, listen, can you, can I come on your show and have like the top manufacturers, top experts? This is free information uh, for, for technicians out there are free, free things. And, uh, and that's how I'm learning, to be honest with you. I'm just talking to the experts and they're just sharing knowledge with the world because they want to help. They, they right. really want to share. So yeah, hit me up in any social media uh, platform, Refrigeration Mentor. Uh, you should be able to find me. Yeah, it looks nice. like I think uh, I think our both your meet and greets and ours are actually uh, side by side Tuesday and Wednesday. So your meet and greet Tuesday is three to four, ours is four to five, and then awesome. Wednesday we're the morning crew and you're the afternoon crew. So, so have yeah. you have you done the podcast pavilion before? No, this is going to be my first one. I did um, the one here in Canada. It's called CMPX. So it's right. our our um, our mechanical show. So last year, me and uh, or this year, earlier this year, me and Gary McCready, uh, we hosted a bunch of podcasts over the two or three days, which was super awesome. So I'm pretty stoked about this. Yeah, this will be our first one. We COVID. Yeah, we were supposed we to both go to Vegas. got COVID <laughs> for the last one. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we're excited about it too. I'm looking forward to meeting you and seeing you in person. And yeah, that's going to be awesome. So anybody out there listening, you want to come to these events. This is where you you build relationships, you network. This is this is it. You got to go to these events. And like I've I've seen it before. I did it. I even said, oh, it's it's so expensive. I, I can't go. Save up. You still got a few months, you know. And if it's not this year, next year, you know, you got to go see these events if you want to get better. You want to grow. You got to go meet the people, see the equipment. I was actually in Germany two weeks ago at the largest refrigeration show in the world. So I could go meet and introduce myself to people, take pictures, uh, connect with people that, you know, want to meet me. And that's the stuff you got to do. And I think building relationships in our industry is the biggest and most important yeah, that's thing. That's key. Building yep. relationships. Well, cool, man. Well, yeah, thanks for coming on and uh, looking forward to seeing you at AHR. And- yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and absolutely, if we can help you with anything, uh, you know, help promote stuff you're working on, let us know. We have no problem doing that. So, yep. oh, man, yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it, man. Well, yeah, man, you. have a good night. Yeah, have a good one. Yeah. Yeah.